Hi, I'm Samuel Jardine, a research analyst for London Politica. In this second video of our Kanzak series, I'll delve into its benefits, challenges and viability. The benefits of Kanzak. If Kanzak happened on the model envisaged by Kanzak International, it would be the world's fourth largest economic bloc by GDP according to 2020 figures after the US, China and the EU, and the world's tenth largest union by population. This block as a shared single market area would give significant negotiation power to the four states involved, allowing for seeking of better terms when engaging with powers like the US or China, or other unions like the EU. Indeed, this is one of Kanzak's main aims. The specific geopolitical benefits of Kanzak, largely for all four constituent nations, revolve around it being a Pacific power enhancer. The UK is currently undergoing a Pacific tilt post-Brexit. It is seeking CPTPP membership, is reorientating its military presence to the region, and is courting India. All of this is in the context of a growing rivalry with China, in which the UK is seeking allies. The concept of the so-called Democracies 10 helps with this, and Kanzak would be a natural aid, bringing together states that have common historic, political, economic and defence ties that could act as a force multiplier and key cornerstone for post-Brexit global Britain in terms of smart power projection and economic strength. Domestically too, Kanzak would be a boon. The EU referendum was polarising and split significantly on lines of age. A key priority during the Brexit negotiations for young people polled showed freedom of movement being the top of their list of priorities to be retained. For a Conservative party who has growing issues appealing to voters under 40, and whose strategists have noted this could become a very big long-term issue if trends are not reversed, the offer of a return to a level of freedom of movement, but this time globally among Kanzak nations, could be a key boon to help the Conservatives pitch to younger people. For Canada, Kanzak would provide a key backup, though not alternative, to its close economic relationship with the USA, a point made important when Trump's America First policy saw key Canadian industries slapped with tariffs. Current Canadian PM Trudeau has noted that US-Canadian relations need to be rebuilt after Trump, and Kanzak would provide a viable platform for Canada to address US relations on an economic basis in a far stronger position. Kanzak would provide a stronger platform for Australia to engage with China from. Currently, Chinese-Australian relations are at their lowest ebb in decades, to quote the director of the Australian-China Relations Institute at the University of Technology, Sydney. There has been a fairly vicious and ongoing trade tariff war. Chinese investment has rapidly decreased in Australia by 61% due to tougher laws aimed at minimising Chinese influence. In the context of these strained relations, a Kanzak union with its closer foreign policy links would increase the pressure that Australia can achieve through soft power international clout, as well as providing an alternative major trade and investment partner with whom relations are more consistently stable than China or the US. For New Zealand, the benefits of Kanzak are more complicated given its smaller international footprint. It generally has chosen to remain neutral regarding China. However, New Zealand has undergone something of a foreign policy reset since 2018, which PM Jacinda Ardern has described as the most significant shift in policy towards the Pacific Islands region in decades. However, the Pacific is becoming an ever-crowded and more contested space, and a Kanzak alliance could again help provide the support needed to make New Zealand's voice heard. Kanzak faces significant challenges. A key criticism to its viability stems from its lack of a geographic centre. Its members are globally dispersed, with their political centres far from one another, with the exception of New Zealand and Australia. This matters, as just how much such a bloc will economically benefit its members for trade, investment and movement still has a significant geographic element. Longer distances increase costs and decrease the likelihood of specialists utilising freedom of movement in the same scale as we saw among close-knit geographic units such as the EU or Australia and New Zealand. In political terms too, distance is an issue. The security interests of the UK and Canada are currently centred on Russia, who is a main player in their high north zones. Australia and New Zealand have no such direct link to Russia and are more concentrated on China. In this context, the closer cooperation and utilisation of defence assets may become difficult in a multipolar world, which may see several security aims in different regions needed at once, rendering meaningful cooperation difficult for such a widely dispersed union. In the same vein, the foreign policy aims are by no means unified among the states. Beyond the broad sweep of being concerned about China, the exact nature of their relationships are very different. Chinese investment in economic links of Australia are still very important. New Zealand is largely neutral regarding China affairs. In this context, the strict stance that Britain seems to be seeking would not be the best form of engagement for all states or viable for them. Kanzak is perceived through a partisan lens, and indeed driven largely by the right of the political spectrum. There are very small elements of left-wing support, but they're not significant. Andrew Bell has pointed out that the historic echoes of Kanzak mean it's a very divisive issue for left and right, with the former perceiving racist and imperial revival overtones, making it politically repugnant as a concept. There is economic imbalance within Kanzak too. 
Kanzak International's claims of similar economic capability, while broadly true, hides the fact that in key areas, Kanzak nations are vastly different, with different economic priorities. The UK, for instance, is protective of its agricultural sector, and Kanzak free trade and anti-subsidy policies would see Australia and New Zealand's agricultural sectors outcompete Britain's due to their favourable economies of scale and regulatory regimes. This in the context of Britain's current pseudo-protectionist drive for jobs would not be politically feasible for the UK to allow. In terms of Kanzak's future prospects, I think we'll be unlikely to see it materialise in the short term, and this is for three key reasons. Firstly, it, it's perceived as too partisan. It lacks the cross-party support that will make it a sustainable policy. Secondly, uh, it lacks the cross-state support in equal measure that will make it viable. Uh, you have in Canada a Conservative opposition who've made it official policy, whereas in the UK it, it's vaguer. The UK is adopting some Kanzak elements, but is not on a Kanzak platform. In Australia, there's no interest in Kanzak seemingly, beyond a small, small group. Uh, and indeed, they're not really in favour of Kanzak policies like freedom of movement among the nations currently, uh, from the trade talks at least. And in New Zealand, it's a third party that's requiring on a right wing coalition uh, that may or may not then influence it into, a ca into pursuing a Kanzak policy. And that's if they be beat Labour first. Um, the third reason is that Kanzak is sort of treading on the toes of too many established uh, organisations that all four constituent nations are quite happy with. You've already got NATO and the Five Eyes for closer security and foreign policy alignment, uh, and things can be done there. You have a wider Commonwealth uh, for sort of a shared historic and cultural ties and education. You have um, CPTPP uh, for economic relations in the in the Pacific and for a sort of a platform of China. And then you've got the D10, of course, which is a potential grouping currently which will embody a far more sort of a far more powerful Kanzak platform in the region in terms of economic links and potential security cooperation. Um, but saying that, there is a chance for Kanzak to take centre stage in policy making if two things happen, I think, and that's if D10, which Britain is pinning its hopes on uh, as its sort of platform for Pacific cooperation, uh, falls through, which it, which it might. D10 has got its very wary some of the g7 countries that make up such a, an organization are quite wary of the intent as it being a platform to engage with china from um it's also if britain's uh, negotiations with india for a closer relationship if they don't materialize in the in the way that britain might wish uh which again would be a key crux of its pacific tilt uh if these two fall through then you expect at least in britain maybe a, a more a greater focus on kanzak as a body, as one of its sort of foreign policy pillars. But again, this is unlikely.